Grade 11, IT Theory, Module 2.3a, The Internet and the World Wide Web. Um, we're going to talk about how the Internet has evolved, and a lot of how it's evolved has been dependent on the type of Internet connection that existed in those days. Um, today, we have fixed location Internet access, which depends on high-speed data transmission, it goes to homes and businesses, and it uses cable technologies. Um, we use ADSL, and um, many lucky people have fiber these days, and this is called fixed broadband internet access. ADSL is obviously a lot slower than fiber, um, but it was still a lot faster than the first internet connections that came about which um, used the old telephone um, system in those days. Then we have mobile internet access. Um, this is when you use a wireless network like the cell phone network to connect to the internet. Um, the picture shows a cell phone tower which would connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot and um, allow you to have a home or an office network. The speeds are normally less than fixed broadband services, um, but with the development of 4G or LTE, access speeds have increased spectacularly. And today, both types of internet connections are used. So in the evolution of the internet, we started off with Web 1.0. This was mostly read-only internet sites. Um, the user was presented with information that he could look at and there were links to other information and files. You clicked on them and you were taken to other pages. Um, sometimes you got an email address which was included for comments or questions, but that was the main user generated content and it didn't become part of the site. The user just sent back replies or comments or questions. The webmaster controlled and updated all of the content, and users could not change the site. In 1996, there were about 45 million global users with 250,000 sites. At the bottom of the page, you see an example of what it would have looked like. And then the first e-commerce sites also emerged. The characteristics of Web 1 um, was that the web pages were static and they were done in HTML. There were hyperlinks so you could click on them and that would take you to another page. Um, the, most websites were not very frequently updated and that's why we called them static. And there were very few content creators, but many content consumers. Maybe they weren't very contented. But, um, yeah, that's what was available. Um, then Web 2 came about. Web 2 was far more interactive, far more social. The users could interact with the website, not just clicking on links, but they would generate some of the contents on the site. So they interact dynamically and they would create wikis, blogs, video sharing sites like YouTube, or social networking sites such as Facebook, where a framework is created by the um, by the generators of the website, but your users generate a lot of the content themselves as well. Web two characteristics are that dynamic web pages allow content to be added by a user. Users become content creators, not just consumers. Social networking sites allow people to link up and keep in touch across the globe. Then we come on to Web 3. This is the intelligent web. Things, things are evolving. Um, the, the semantic or intelligent web, Web 3, is actually still quite a thing of the future. We're, we're starting to use it and it is coming about in some areas, but um, it is still 
it is still a futuristic idea at the moment. Obviously, it's driven by high-speed, high-bandwidth internet access. Um, because of all the content that is generated and the way it works, um, it's going to need very high-speed internet. Um, in Web3, there are more and more types of devices which are connected to the web. And it uses a whole range of technologies, um, things like data mining, which we will touch on later in the course, more natural language interfaces, and artificial intelligence techniques. All of these are making Web3 more and more of a reality. It makes the web far more human because you can talk to the internet and it responds. You don't need to be an HTML or Java programmer necessarily. It gives you automatic responses. So possible trends of Web3. It's not limited by incompatibilities between different hardware and software applications and data formats. It's become a lot cleverer where it can handle different hardware and software um, platforms. It's mobile ca ca capability. Um, there's an improvement in wireless internet, making Web3 possible. There are increased broadband speeds and more reliable connectivity and new mobile devices which are far more powerful. And these also make Web3 possible. This um, table shows you a, a summary of the difference between the three, type, the, the three webs. Web 1, it's about the world to get everyone connected. Web 2 was about like-minded people. They would share and interact on the internet. And Web 3 is about the individual. He receives the right content at the right time from anywhere on any device. Web 1 was in e-commerce. E-commerce told you this is what we have. For Web 2, people who bought this product also bought that. Um, that's where we're at. If you shop on Take A Lot, you can put a comment about what you just bought and tell everybody whether it was worth buying or not. And then Web 3, e-commerce won't just show you a whole big website full of items to buy. They will offer you what they think you need. We believe this is what you're looking for. Web 1, mostly read-only. Web 2 was read-write, interactive. And Web 3, the internet is far more personal. Web 1, there were home pages, forum, forums, chat and email. Web 2 was about wikis, blogs, RSS, microblogging and social networks. And Web 3 is called the semantic web. Web 1, we had banner advertising, Web 2, interactive web advertising, and Web 3, behavioral advertising.